All right, got my mic here. Uh, gonna talk Scream. I ripped that freaking franchise to shreds the last go round on the biggest mistakes. I'm looking forward to. What the hell? Who the hell is this thing? Hello? Hello, drum dums. The Halloween fanboy. You think your franchise is so good and Scream just can't stack up. Well, you did your biggest mistakes and you ripped the franchise across the coals. Well, now we're gonna have a little fun. You're gonna do the top 10 things the franchise gets right. And I'm gonna be watching. And let's see if you get to number one. Good luck. Well, that escalated quickly. What is up, guys? It is time to do the top 10 things the Scream franchise gets right. No pressure, according to that intro, but seriously, this is going to be a lot of fun, actually. Um, I've done all three of the, the big three for Gets Right and Biggest Mistakes, and uh, I did Biggest Mistakes for Scream, so now we're going to do Gets Right. Now, funny thing, yesterday, you know me and my audio problems, right? I recorded this whole goddamn thing. And on my um, external mic here, this is what I'm guessing I did, because when I put it into my computer... I, I heard like like background echo and it, the audio wasn't nearly as loud. I think I plugged it into the, the headphone jack instead of the line in. And I've done that before because I'm a big, big dummy. So I figured to make it up to you guys, I went to Twitter. I was like, hey guys, I'll give some shout outs before I get to my number one. And you tell me what you think the franchise gets right. So I'll, I'll mention a few of those before we mention number one, okay? So it's going to make it fun too. But anyway, let's jump right into it. Going to give you one honorable mention, and that is going to be for the late, great Wes Craven. I love the man to death. As a matter of fact, after I do this, I'm going to be reviewing a movie that he wrote, Hills Have Eyes Part 2, the, the actual uh, sequel to the remake. But uh, we wouldn't be here without Wes. You know, Kevin Williamson wrote the great script for Scream, but Scream is what it is because of Wes's direction. It's so vibrant. It's so fun. And that's the great thing about Wes. You can tell that in any movie he does, <clears throat> there's just this sense of joy. Like, you can tell he loves what he's doing. But he is one of those directors that has this certain stamp that I cannot put my finger on. Like, I can spot a Carpenter movie from a mile away. But Craven, I think, is more of a virtuoso. Like, he can handle pretty much any genre. And it seems like he can take all of his horror genres and make them stand on their own. Like, Hills of Eyes feels completely different than Scream, and then he does a lot of these one-off movies like People Under the Stairs. He's just a virtuoso, and he is sorely missed. He was one of the greats of horror, and I, I thank Wes for Scream. And he directed all four movies. He's the only director I can think of that can claim that, that actually directed four movies in a row in a franchise. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, number 10, The Rules. That's one of the fun things about Scream is that in the first movie, Randy, he established all these rules. Wh what you must do to survive a horror movie. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. And these are rules that we've all pretty much known subconsciously throughout the years, but it's never been like fully stated until uh, scream in 1996 when Randy comes out and he says there's certain rules that one must abide by number two You can never drink or do drugs <laughs> You can't have sex. You can't say I'll be right back number three Never ever ever under any circumstances say I'll be right back because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. You have to be smart. You got to be resourceful you know, and, and of course there's some gray areas there, but it just added another element of fun to the already fun franchise. Scream is probably one of the funnest franchises out there. And you can throw the character Randy on this as well. This, this category belongs to him. He's the one that came up with all these rules, and he's the one that had all these great moments throughout those first two movies. It's a shame that the guy freaking died uh, in the second movie. And by the way, there are spoilers in this freaking countdown. You should, you should know that. Which leads me to number nine, great core characters. Arguably, I think the, the Scream franchise probably has the best characters in terms of like quantity and quality. You have Dewey and you have Gale and of course Sydney, And then you got 
uh, side characters like Randy and Billy and Stu. The first movie alone is just stacked full of great characters that have their own voice and mannerisms and they feel real and relatable. That's a great thing about the, the characters in the Scream franchise. They're all very relatable. And not just the first movie. You jump over to the second movie, the third movie. Not so much the third movie. Scream 4 with especially characters like Kirby, who pretty much represents us. Kirby is such an awesome freaking character. And so beloved that we're like begging for her to come back in Scream 5. That's the power of side characters in Scream. Number eight, horror comedy done right. Um, I love horror comedy. Um, when you cross over to like the parodies, which is what Scary Movie ended up being, then you're kind of um, separating yourself from a certain audience. I mean, us horror fans, we love a good laugh, but we still like a good scare. Scream gives us both of those things very well, actually. And I'd say Scream probably finds the best balance of horror and comedy. Uh, you could be laughing, and then in the very next scene, scared to death. Uh, they don't hold back, they don't pull any punches, and you gotta think Wes Craven for that. His direction, he had a knack for handling comedy and horror. And there's so many examples of Craven doing this in, in his other movies. If you wanted to pick apart other directors like Carpenter. Carpenter, he has comedy in his movies, but he mostly focuses on horror. But with Scream, this franchise, there is plenty of comedy throughout. So by the end of the movie, you're just pretty much doubled over with joy. But I can't emphasize enough that there are some really scary moments in this franchise, especially the opening of the first movie. When we get to the horror zone and the kills and all that, they leave the comedy aside. They make it as serious as possible. And they, you know, there's plenty of blood. Number seven, the voice. One of the big things about Scream that kind of separates it from other franchises is that you do have a killer that can talk and he has a signature style, you know, a, a signature rhythm to his voice. And Roger L. Jackson is that secret weapon. And this is an actor that didn't really want exposure. He didn't want people to see what he looked like. And that works for the character because it just makes him that much creepier. I've always had a thing too for characters. They, you know, the phone rings, they pick up the phone and then there's just this sinister voice on the other end of it. And Scream does it the best. It's an essential element to the franchise and they use it in every movie. And because anybody could be the character because of this voice changer, that just makes it that much more fun. But that voice by Roger L. Jackson. CC, who's this? Do you want to die tonight, CC? It's important that the voice has a certain sound to it uh, because not everybody has a sinister, creepy type of voice. But Roger L. Jackson probably has one of the creepiest voices out there. Number six, the mask. <laughs> this mask, uh, thank you, Mr. Brandon Tabato from your fan film Ghostface, by the way, who sent me this. Um, this was, I guess it was kind of a happy accident because when they first wrote the script for Scream, I don't think they had an, an idea of what the mask was going to look like. But uh, you guys might remember the, there's a painting that actually has this face on it. That I think it's called the Scream painting or something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. You will. It's a creepy looking mask. And, and it's kind of like what Myers had. You know, it's a blank slate. Uh, especially in it's just like pure white form. But it also looks kind of disfigured and manipulated. It doesn't look human. But it's hard to come up with really interesting and memorable masks. And I think that's part of the reason why it makes Ghostface an icon. It's, you know, part of the reason. There's so many different reasons, you know, that make that recipe work. But the mask is a, a signature part of it. Number five, I said there's going to be spoilers. It's the ultimate whodunit. The slasher genre especially has a lot of whodunit plot lines. And I think, again, I think Scream does it the best. I remember watching that first movie, nobody suspected that there were going to be two killers. There's been two killers in the past, I'm sure. But Scream took that idea and really perfected it. You know, you have moments, like especially in the first movie, where one of the killers could die earlier in the movie, or at least you think he died, but then he didn't die, he actually came back. Corn syrup. Same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry. Oh, 
Surprise, Sydney. And I think that's genius on the part of Kevin Williamson because it scratches off your list of who could be the killer. Automatically you think, okay, he can't be the killer because he's dead now. But then boom, he pops up at the end of the movie and you're like, oh wait, how did he live? You know, and then they do the little flashback and they show. It's genius. And so after that first movie, pretty much all bets were off in terms of who the killer could be. But it's just another fun part of the franchise too, just trying to figure out who the killer is throughout. Keeps you on your toes. And I guess to tack on to this category too, I gotta give major props to Billy and Stu in the first movie. I don't think they can ever be topped because they were so freaking likable throughout the whole movie and yet they're so different from each other, you know? Uh, Billy is very dark and brooding and Stu is pretty much a wise ass. And then once they're the killers, they have this great back and forth with each other. You know, you hit me with the phone dick and all that stuff. Probably one of my favorite final acts in terms of like reveals. Number four, it pays homage in a big way to the classics. You can count off dozens of horror properties that are mentioned and honored in the Scream franchise. Halloween, uh, Texas Chainsaw, Dawn of the Dead, The Hills Have Eyes, Amityville Horror, uh, Last House on the Left, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, My Bloody Valentine, When a Stranger Calls. Hell, the first movie majorly pays homage to the first Halloween. They even show the movie in the final act on the TV. That's the movie that they're all watching. Look, look, here it comes. But no horror property is safe in every single movie. Like I said, there's like dozens of them. They mentioned like Prom Night and Last House on the Left. I mean, hell, I'm looking at like all my VHSs that are behind the camera over there and I can spot like three or four different horror properties that are actually mentioned in Scream and it's really cool. Number three, and this is a big one, Sydney. Sydney is one of the most important final girls in horror and slasher history. This is a character that has been in every single movie and she's not the same person as she was in the first movie to the fourth movie. The fourth movie, she is a very tough, hardened type of person. She is pretty much what Laurie Strode was trying to be in Halloween 2018. I think Nev Campbell did it better. I think Nev Campbell really knows this character inside and out and she utilizes the best parts of the character throughout the franchise. Sydney might be different in one scene than she is in another scene, you know, or in another movie. Uh, that's the fun of the character and we want her to live. That's the most important thing. We're not at the point right now where we're begging for them to kill off Sydney. Like speaking personally, and, and I can speak for a lot of people that have said, I'm ready for Laurie Strode to die. And I hate to freaking rag on Laurie Strode in a scream countdown, but I don't really hear people say that too much. They say it about like Gail, maybe even Dewey, but people want Sydney to live. And there's a reason for that. She's so goddamn effective. Now, number two and number one, I think I'm actually gonna switch them. I do this sometimes. You know, sometimes I'm like thinking on my feet as I'm doing these, and I think number two is actually number one. So, I'm gonna tell you what the new number two is. And that is that Scream pretty much saved the horror genre in the 90s. Uh, it's a big one too. And this really did deserve to be number one, but they're interchangeable really, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But if you remember in the 90s, before Scream came out, there were slim pickings uh, in horror and especially in the slasher genre. Sure, you can pick out a couple of nice horror movies here and there, but there wasn't like this stride, this horror stride, and we were just constantly getting movies like we do now. I think even now we have to pay respect to Scream. I think Scream kind of started uh, the, the horror craze that I think it's still going on since. And if we all remember like the slasher craze from like 78 throughout the 80s. And that was all because of Halloween. Scream did what Halloween did, actually. It reignited the slasher genre. And we had all these really fun slasher horror movies in the 90s and even like the Millennium with the Millennium Slashers. I actually put on my biggest mistakes of the Scream franchise that it created the Millennium Slasher. Some might see that as a negative because the Millennium Slasher is for a certain type of horror fan, I guess. And I'm not knocking them at all. Sometimes I'm in the mood for a nice, fun Millennium Slasher. You know, there's nothing too deep there. It's just fun. But Scream pretty much created that. And so now, before I get to number one, I'm going to go to Twitter. I'm going to read a few of your responses. I was actually looking earlier, and I uh, bookmarked one of them, because I know Lizzie is like the biggest Scream fan out there. And uh, she sent one. So it says, another thing I love about Sydney Prescott, so she's talking about Sydney is she has no hesitation when it comes to killing the bad guys. Good point, actually. 
Like, yeah, she's shocked, devastated, but that doesn't stop her from being like, I don't care who you are, fuck you. <laughs> Very true, and that's a good one. And Jesus, I got like 32 responses on this, so thank you guys for that. That's awesome. So this is a good one from Tom. Uh, at Rollins Triple R75, he says, Rewatches are good, but with the Scream movies, the best part about them is watching them for the first time and trying to guess who the killer is or killers uh, with the clues we get throughout the films. Yeah, and I, and I mentioned that earlier about, you know, the, the whodunits, like the ultimate whodunit. Um, Hormizer Monty G, he says, uh, Casting David Arquette as Dewey, he's got that correct boyish charm to play that character and have a a crush on Gail. Yeah, Dewey was a different type of character, actually. He, you know, he's not pretty much the, the type of character that we constantly see in slasher movies. There's something uh, different, uh, something a little extra about Dewey, and he's just such a fun character, and we can't help but like him. He's really funny, but he's also, like, sweet and endearing, uh, all that great stuff. And David Arquette is the reason for that. He's just that type of actor, he, and he's so likable. Uh, Steve says the first one played expertly well with the red herring and made us making us believe we knew the killer was Billy uh, giving us enough evidence to believe we were wrong and in the end turned out we were half right yeah exactly and I, I was mentioning that mentioning that earlier uh, about the ultimate who who done it uh, Lindsay Brooks says I think the acting is very consistent throughout one four one through four most sequels downgrade little by little but for me this franchise keeps its tone and stays on point. And I was reading through these, and um, that's a good point, Lindsay, by the way. But I was reading through these, and one person stated what my number one is. So let me see if I can find them. Uh, I got to read this one, because she says it's her very first horror movie. Uh, Queen Glimmer, she says, I think what Scream did right. This is coming from someone who grew up with it as my first horror movie. I remember watching. That's pretty cool. Was that they made realistic characters. These characters were fleshed out so when it came to seeing their blood spill, it actually had impact. Yeah, and then and I was talking about that at the beginning of the countdown. Very, very true. For example, Tatum Riley, if she were any other in any other movie, she'd be the slutty blonde girl. But here, she's just a, um, a human who has a witty sense of humor. Yeah, and she's that one scene where she tells Sydney, bam, you know, knocked her ass out or something like that. <laughs> The sassy attitude and a genuine love for her best friend and boyfriend. She felt like a real person you could meet. Very true, very true. Okay, so now we're going to jump into number one, and I'll read this one uh, from this person that said what it was. Number one, the opening of the first Scream movie, killing off the girl who you thought was going to be the final girl. This person, Charlie, says, One thing I think it does very right is subversion of expectations. Whether it be casting a name like Drew Barrymore only to kill her off in the opening and having two killers as opposed to one. I think the Scream franchise nails uh, the shocking and surprising moments. Very true. And that's why it made my number one. I think the opening of Scream is probably one of the most important scenes in horror history. And yes, you can say that this is similar to Psycho, but... They still pulled it off perfect because if you remember the opening of the scene. What's that noise? Popcorn. You making popcorn? Uh huh. I only eat popcorn at the movies. Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? It's very light. You know, she's making popcorn. This guy calls her, and it sounds like you know uh, a guy from school, and he's flirting. And we, we all can relate to that. But then there's a point in the conversation where there's a little bit of a shift in tone and, and something feels wrong. The, the safety net feels like it's, it's starting to dissipate. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. What did you say? And then it gets really, really messed up. But we never think that Drew Merrimore is going to be killed. And sure enough, she is killed and she's killed violently and she has to watch this guy outside her window his intestines pour out so what a, a start to the first scream movie to show that hey this is a died in the wool horror movie you're gonna have fun with this movie but don't think that you're gonna get off light in terms of like scares and violence they're not gonna pull any punches and that first scene set all that up so anyway guys that's it that is uh top 10 things the scream franchise gets right i had a lot of fun doing this glad i recorded a second time too because i feel better about this time and thank you for all those responses on Twitter. You guys are really freaking awesome. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks where we talk horror all day and every day and on Fridays. We do free for Fridays. Follow me at Drum Dums on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Do you like scary movies?